as, uh, as part of any uh, evaluation of someone complaining of hip pain, knee pain, foot or ankle pain, it's important when able to see how they walk. Um, so I have my patients walk up and down a few times and I can get a good sense of their alignment, both in the coronal plane, which is the plane that you're facing, um, as well as the sagittal pain from a profile view. Uh, so that's part of an initial exam for any complaint of the lower extremities. So first step is to walk down the hallway uh, just in a normal pace. So what I'm looking for is I start at the hips, I move down to the knees and also the ankles. I have them walk back and forth a few times. First thing I'm looking for is what we call a normal reciprocal gait pattern. That is, are the arms moving opposite the opposite leg uh, or are they moving in tandem? Um, I also, I'm looking to see if there's any leaning of the trunk from side to side. I want to see if there's a shift of the body weight over one extremity over the other. And I want to see if they're lurching. Lurching uh, is a potential problem with the hip musculature, in particular the abductors. I'm also looking at the knees. I want to see if there's any angular deformities, such as a varus or valgus knees, better known as, as um, bow-legged or knock-kneed. And then we move down to the feet, where I'm looking to see if they're supinated, if they're pronated, and also what their foot progression angle is. The foot progression angle um, often will be a measurement of the anatomy of the hip, and this is a good clue as to uh, what the anatomy, the normal anatomy is of that part. Um, sometimes I'll have someone adjust their gait. I'll have them walk on their heels to see if they're able to do that. This is a good neurologic test to see if they can dorsiflex their ankle. I'll also have them walk on their toes as well. It's another sign to make sure that neurologically they are intact. Um, also, I will have them sometimes increase the length of their stride to see if that recreates their pain. That's often very common with hip pathology where people will make shorter strides to avoid the pain. Um, and occasionally also have them consciously out toe with their walk and then in toe as well. And that usually gives me a good assessment of uh, their function. And I'm also asking them, uh, does this, did that recreate your pain? Uh, did that make your pain get better? And oftentimes I'll have them speed up their gait as well, because that sometimes will elicit uh, something that I might not find with a normal uh, gait pattern. Now, how much do you miss things here that you might catch if you ask them to now climb a step or something like that? Uh, absolutely. Um, so my next portion of the exam is to do a more of a dynamic functional test where I have someone squat with two legs, squat with one leg, mm -hmm. and that's usually the part where I'll get a little more information. And oftentimes I have to come back to the gait test. If I find something later that I was surprised about, I might have them do that again. Got it. So the next part of the exam is to evaluate someone while they're standing and we go through some dynamic tests to evaluate uh, their muscle strength and their function and also gives me a good sense of uh, the spinal alignment as well to see if any of these potential problems in the lower extremity may be coming from the back. So first thing I have you do, Peter, is to face that way. Uh, I'm first checking, to see if the shoulder heights are the same, as well as I'll grab the iliac crest on either side to make sure that it's even. Next, I'll have you bend forward. I say, try to touch your toes if you can. Great, and then I have you stand up, and I'm looking at the alignment of the spine, and then to lean back, all the while asking if any of these movements hurt. Okay, stand up straight, and then twist to the right, twist to the left, straight forward, bend to the right, and bend to the left. And I'm just getting a general assessment if, 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 that's, if they're capable of doing that and whether that elicits any pain. While Peter's facing away from me, I'll have him go up on his toes and I can get a good sense of his heel alignment. You can come back down. The angle of the foot is very important. I'm looking at the heel alignment. And when someone goes up on their toes, I wanna to make sure that their heel goes into varus and that they recreate their arch. 
Peter has good arches here, and sometimes that's a clue as to potential problems, whether it be the hip, the knee, or even the ankle. Okay, then I have him turn around, and I do the same thing again. Again, I just wanna have him go up on his toes. I get a better sense of the formation of the arch and balance as well, and then you go flat down on the feet. Next part of the standing exam is to do some dynamic tests. So first thing I'll have someone do is to lift up the one of the legs. Usually I'll do, if, if the person's complaining of right hip pain, I'll have them uh, stand on the other side so that um, I wanna see what they can do with their quote unquote normal side. So first thing I want you to do is just stand on one leg on the left side and try to hold balance. And you hold it there to see if that, if there's any swaying from side to side, how much their body shifts over that side, or if they're having trouble balancing. And then I have them do the opposite side as well. What we're looking for here is to see if the pelvis tilts also. If the pelvis tilts during this maneuver, it may mean that the hip abductors, particularly the gluteus medius, may be either injured, it could be torn, or it could be weak, or it could be a neurologic problem where the muscle's not firing. You could stand up straight. Then I have someone do a two-legged squat and come back up. With what, what do they do with their hands? So I don't have them do anything with the hands. I want to see what they do first. I want to see how they're used to doing it. Um, sometimes I'll change that up, for example. And some, how do you want their feet? Do you want this to be a narrow squat, a wide squat? I ask them, I, first I let them do what they want to do. I want to see what's comfortable for them and how they're normally squatting. Some people keep their foot feet yeah. outward. Some people go really close. Um, and some people put their arms up. Some people put it on their chest. So I just want to see what their, what yeah. their, their normal is, what's comfortable for them. Some people don't do squats regularly, so they're not really interested in form. And to be honest, I'm not really interested in form either for this particular part. I just want to see how their body's reacting to that movement. I guess not, if you just said squat in the easiest way you could, if you had to spend a day down here, what would you, how would you do it? It would probably be at this angle. Right, right. And most people can't stay, do that either. And the other thing I'm, I'm looking for is, come back up, is some people will put their arms straight up in the air when they squat, uh, and that tilts their pelvis. And so sometimes it's easier to do that because, they're, because it, what it does is it, it accentuates the lordosis of the spine, which tilts the pelvis forward, and that will affect the hip flexors. So if they do that first, I'll have them change to bring their arms down, try to make their back a little flatter and do the same squat to see if there's any change in the motion at the hip. Okay. Um, the next thing I do, so then I get a good sense of their balance. I get a good sense of their hip musculature. Uh, and then I wanna check um, their, their natural connective tissue. So some people have connective tissue disease. We have something called the Baton score where we get a sense of if someone has uh, loose ligaments. Ehlers-Danlos would be an example of a connective tissue disorder that I want to know about because that may mean they have specific injuries. So it's a, basically a nine point scale. The first thing I do is I, I check to see if their pinky goes to 90 degrees, if their thumb comes to their forearm, on either side, that's each of those is one point. If they hyperextend their elbows greater than 10 degrees, same with their knees. And then I wanna see if they could put their hands on the floor. So I could tell right away, Peter doesn't have connective tissue disease, even though he can do that. The, yeah, other, the other things don't add up to enough. Exactly, exactly. So first we move on to the hip exam. Uh, first thing I do when I'm evaluating a patient is I, I inspect the legs. I'm looking for any asymmetry and atrophy. Uh, and the first motion I do is, is to, I just do, it's called a log roll, a log roll exam. And I'm comparing both sides and I want to see how much motion there is. I'm looking at the feet to see if any uh, one of them is stiffer than the other. Uh, and then I have the next move is to first I have extend the leg and I'm checking the flexibility of the hamstring, whether this is difficult or not, and it's very easy here. And then I have Peter hold the leg right where it is, and I push down. This is called the Stinchfield exam. 
And what I'm really doing right here is I'm, I'm irritating the femoral acetabular joint. I'm causing pressure in that joint to see if that generates pain. And sometimes I'll do it, I'll hold it there, push against me, Peter, and then I'll palpate in the area to see if that hurts. Uh, and sometimes pain in the front of the hip can be related to a strain of the muscle, or sometimes it's a problem deep inside the joint. If it's deep inside the joint, uh, it doesn't really hurt to push in that area. If it's a strain of one of the hip flexors, it'll be tender in that area. For example, the rectus femoris will be tender there and sometimes even the iliopsoas, but that's a little deeper of a structure. So um, after I, I do that, I have Peter bend both of his knees. Uh, Peter, I want you to touch your pubic bone right in the front. This is where I'm checking to see uh, the abdominal wall musculature. Some people develop injuries where the muscle attaches to the pubic bone. And I have them try to do a little bit of a crunch or a sit up. Sometimes I have them elevate their legs straight up in the air to see if that generates any pain. Does that cause any pain? No. Nope. Good. So then I'm, I'm working my way lateral. I'm going to have Peter adduct, adduction of the hip. I'm going to have him flex both knees, push in towards the center. Does that hurt? Sometimes I'll palpate in the adductor musculature, push into the center. Good, any pain there? No. So this is, this is anterior groin pain. I'm looking for the adductor muscle. I'm looking for the um, abdominal muscles to see they're attached, to see if, there's any, if that generates any pain. Now, how are you able to differentiate between if I just have a strained adductor, which would hurt very much if you did that, because I've been in that pain before, um, versus a problem in the actual acetabulum? So they both may cause pain, uh, typically because I've done that other maneuver, the Stinchfield test. Um, that's not going to necessarily hurt the adductors. So if, if that hurt and this hurts, uh, I have to sometimes do more than one exam. I'll have to do one or two or three exams to try to narrow it down because a lot of these tests are sensitive but not necessarily specific. So I have to add multiple tests to figure out what's happening. So then we just, we just did adduction, pushing to the center. Now I'm gonna have Peter do abduction, abduction, and I'm gonna palpate along the greater trochanter of the hip. Um, and the gluteus medius and gluteus minimus attach there. There's also a bursa there. And if I have him push against my hand, I wanna see if that generates any pain. And if it does, and it's not the muscle, which of course can also hurt, the TFL can hurt, the glute med can hurt, all these things can That's hurt. That's right. But if, is that gonna produce a bony point tenderness on the greater trochanter as well, potentially? It will. So for uh, a tensor muscle strain, it doesn't usually hurt right on the bone, um, but a gluteus medius tear, gluteus minimus tear will, bursitis over that area will. Um, and so again, it's one of those things where if it hurts there, I'm not done. It hurts in a lot of people normally too, even without any pain, people are often are tender in that yeah. area. You know, we see that with the coracoid too. There are certain times when you palpate and it hurts. I have to check the other side and I say, well, does that hurt too? And oftentimes it hurts and it's just a tender bony yeah. prominence. Okay, so then I have, I want to check motion of the hip. The first thing I do when someone is in the supine position is I do something called circumduction where I'm bringing the leg around. I'm bringing the head internal rotation, flexion, abduction and extension. That sometimes will cause popping of a tendon called the um, iliopsoas tendon in the front of the hip, which could be absolutely normal. If it's painful, it may indicate some pathology of that tendon or even potentially some instability of the hip, mm. um, like we see sometimes when we manipulate an unstable shoulder. Uh, so next we move on to internal rotation. Internal rotation of the hip, I bring it to 90 degrees and I'm comparing internal with external. He's got very even internal and external rotation. And then I will check that on the contralateral. Now you're not really torquing on me as much as no. I would torque on me. So you're, you're doing this in a very gentle way. Correct, because I'm not trying to stress the joint. You're not trying to go to Mac. I'm, I'm not, I, I wanna see when I get, I have a feeling, sort of a feedback of what is um, sort of the normal comfortable range of motion. The other thing is when I'm examining somebody who's got a joint problem, their hip hurts and I torque on it, I'm done. I won't be able to really test anything else because everything I do will hurt. So it's important not only to do that in a sort of a gentle way, but also 
If I'm suspecting something in particular, I do that last. So this is sort of a normal progression if we did everything, but um, I will change the order of the exam based on what I think it is, based on the history that I took, based on the gait exam, based on the standing exam. In general surgery, we would do the rectal exam last, just for so that you, reason, I think. So you can leave right just, after. Yeah, to, yeah, exactly. Why, put them, yeah, why, why upset everybody at the beginning? Same thing. So, um, so th then, okay, so now this is a part to that, to your point, where I will stress that motion a little bit. It's called the Fadir test at flexion, adduction, internal rotation. And there's also something called a scour test where I'm trying to see if this elicits any pain. What I'm doing is I'm rotating the, the femoral head and the neck in the acetabulum, the cup, to see if that irritates the labrum specifically. And sometimes that'll be indicative of not only a labral tear, uh, but of something called femoral acetabular impingement. Also in this position, I go straight up and I flex the hip. Sometimes that will cause some impingement in the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is another structure of the pelvis, which sometimes causes pain. So this is called the scour test or the FADIR, where I'm just seeing if that generates pain. From there, I move to the Faber test, which is flexion, abduction, and external rotation. And what I'm looking for is to see how far the knee will flop down. Will it go all the way to the table or is it elevated? And I sort of just as a general rule, I'm sort of seeing how many fists I can get under there. If it's less than one fist, sometimes that will indicate some laxity of the joint. If it's more than two fists, sometimes it may indicate some tightness, which may be a capsular problem or some muscle tightness, but sometimes it's also arthritis of the hip. And if it's muscle, is it mostly the adductor? Um, yeah, it, it's because that's what's sort of stopping it. Yeah. We, we see less of that for this particular motion. Oftentimes, I'm, I'm really thinking about arthritis in that area or some sort of instability if it's, if it's too loose. Mm. And then the, the other thing and is- And that, that would be in a labral tear, would it be too loose potentially? Uh, it's a little different than the shoulder in that regard um, because of the, the socket is different. So there are certain individuals who have very loose hips and that's due to developmental problems. Um, it's often due to what their activity is. Ballet dancers, for example, are incredibly flexible, and so their hips will come all the way out, which, you know, there's a difference, just like in the shoulder, there's a difference between um, instability and laxity. So instability is more of a symptomatic laxity. So, but, and I'm also comparing to the other side, and if there's any difference, and this one comes down a little bit more, uh, but again, if it's not generating any, generating any necessary pain, I'm not necessarily too concerned about it. Okay, so we did internal rotation, external rotation, a little bit of abduction motion. Um, now, Peter, I wanna have you sit up because I'm gonna check the flexion and extension of your hips. So I'm gonna have you sit all the way at the very edge like you're about to fall off. Keep coming, keep coming. I'm gonna grab, you want you to grab your left knee and lie down and bring it to your chest. It's called the Modified Thomas Test. And I'm just, try, just let your leg hang down comfortably. And a couple of things here. I'm looking at the angle between his thigh and the table. And if I push down, what I'm really assessing is how tight are the, um, the hip flexor muscles, in particular the iliopsoas. So he's a little bit elevated from neutral. Some people go all the way down. Again, depending on what the particular complaint is, there may be stiffness because of arthritis. It may be stiffness because of um, a, a tightness of the flexor muscles, or it might be loose because of instability. And the other motion I'm checking here is to see the iliotibial band. So some people are easily go f towards midline, some people pop back. And so this may indicate some tightness of the structures on the lateral aspect of the hip. And then I'll compare the other one. So you bring your knee to this side and let this hang. So your iliotibial bands are probably a little bit tighter, not much, and see if, and also I'm checking to see, can you just let your leg hang? Because that's about it. So that will give us indication of some quad tightness too. Mm. And also to see how much the hip is elevated compared to the table. Okay. So we got more to do. <laughs>
So now we move to the lateral position where I have you get lie onto your left side. And so I get a first thing I do is I check the spine. I want to make sure that that doesn't hurt. I check the SI joint to see if that generates any pain. This is where I'll check where the sartorius originates from and the tensor muscle as well. Um, and, and again, here's gonna be another opportunity to check your abductor strain. So I'll have Peter lift up your leg and don't let me push down. Good, and, and that's, it's, a, it's a more sensitive test in the sense if you really have an abductor problem, this is hard to do. And this, relax your leg completely. Um, so before we were looking at IT, IT band tightness or tightness on the, on the lateral aspect of the hip. And I wanna see if Peter's knee can come all the way down to the table, and that's good. Good, so he's pretty good there. Um, and also this is an opportunity we can check to see if there's any instability. Um, just like the shoulder, we sort of do this provocative maneuver where I'm pushing on the greater trochanter to see if I could push the ball forward. And if that's very uncomfortable, that will generate pain. And then I extend the hip in different positions to see if it's more comfortable. So as we adduct your hip, Peter, it's a little tighter than if we abduct and extend. And sometimes if that generates pain, it may be impingement in the posterior aspect of the hip. And that's where um, you know, palpation in the sciatic notch is important to see if there's any inflammation of the nerve or surrounding structures. Next, we go prone. And again, another opportunity to evaluate the spine. Um, again, greater trochanter and sciatic notch to see if anything's tender, and then the origin of the hamstring. And if that generates any pain, it means I need to dive deeper into finding out what's wrong with that area. I'll also check his quad tightness by seeing how far I can bring his heel to his butt, and the same on the other side. Again, this is another great way to check motion of the hip. So I already have a sense from doing it at, with the hip flexed to 90 degrees, and this is with the hip extended. And what I'm doing here is I'm feeling the greater trochanter with my left hand and I'm rotating the hip. And wherever it's most prominent gives me an idea of the anatomy of his hip. So he is, has a little normal anaversion of the hip and fairly symmetric. So then um, next thing I do is I have Peter, I want you to lift up your leg off the table. Straight. Straight up, yep, and back down. And what I'm doing here, I wanna see whether he engages his hamstring first or his gluteus maximus first. So I want you to do it again. Good, and back down. I do that a few times, go ahead. So Peter engages his gluteus maximus before his hamstring, and that's a good pattern that we often like to see. And that's pretty much it in this, oh um, yeah, that's pretty much it in this position. That's good. So as we move on to the knee exam, um, it's always important, number one, to inspect the knee. You wanna get a good sense of if there are any uh, abnormalities just on an inspection. I'm looking for swelling or what we call an effusion, which would be fluid inside the joint. I'm looking for any scars from previous surgery, um, some erythema, some warmth. I'm also looking to see if there's any atrophy of the, of the quad muscle, in particular looking, looking at the VMO. Um, and then I, I move on to the palpation part of the exam. First thing again, just like the hip, I do a log roll of the knee. Uh, the, it's also important anytime I'm examining a knee is to examine the hip. There are times when people can have only knee pain without any actual knee problem and have the problem in the hip. There are- IT band would be an example of that, right? Well, it's very common, for example, to for, um, it's not common, but it's certainly known that you can have something like hip arthritis or a labral tear. And because of the neuroanatomy of the joints, you only have knee pain and no hip pain at all. So it's really important to make sure there's nothing happening inside the hip when you examine the knee. And there have been times where people have even had surgery on their knee because of knee pain, even though the problem was the hip. And that's because if you have someone, let's say has arthritis of the knee and arthritis of the hip, 
and they complain of knee pain, they get an injection inside the knee because they have arthritis. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because the problem's really in the hip. They get a knee replacement. Mm. They still have the exact same pain until someone figures out that it's coming from the hip. So and it's truly a referred pain. Truly referred pain. There, we think it's because the obturator nerve has an articular branch in the hip and an articular branch in the knee. And so sometimes it's just you don't know where it's coming from. It's just your interpretation of the irritation. But it's fairly easy to figure out on an exam because, for example, if you came in and said, I have a lot of knee pain and I was able to do this to your knee and you didn't have any discomfort, even if you had arthritis, um, and then I went like this and you're like, oh, that kills. Um, I'll say, listen, Peter, you don't really have a knee problem. You have a hip problem. And oftentimes it's hard to convince somebody wow. of this. And there was one patient I had who just refused to believe. I got x-ray said, look, you have both arthritis of both joints, but I believe this is coming from your hip. She says, doc, this is my knee. I think I know. Uh, and so I, I went to the computer and I Googled. And you know how it sort of auto populates the words? How come my hip pain, my hip problem, and then it finished it off causes only knee pain and then like, okay, I, I believe. I, believe, I, I thought believe. you were gonna say you did an injection in the hip, it got, the knee pain got better. Well, so then that's what I do. That's what I, that's the next step. I say, listen, let's do this. I'm going to inject your hip. Let's see if it goes away. I'll just give you some lidocaine in there. And if it goes away, then yeah. we can move forward. So, for, so the hip exam is normal. Now we're on to the knee portion. Um, I roll the leg. I just sort of trying to make, uh, the patient comfortable and then I flex up the knee and bring it down. I want to see what the motion is. I will hyperextend the knee and I'll compare to both sides. This is, um, if there's any process inside the hip joint, that will be uncomfortable. If there's fluid in there, if there's a meniscus tear, if you had an acute ligament injury, when I hyperextend on either side, even I can feel someone tensing up. So there's, there's a good sort of a first test and it's pretty gentle to see if there's any process deep inside the knee. So I've taken care of motion and now I'm gonna flex the knees to 90 degrees um, and then I'm gonna palpate the different areas of the knee. So I usually start in the, in the front of the knee. I wanna check the patellar tendon where it attaches, where it um, originates from the inferior pole of the patella. I move my way down to the tibial tuberosity, I'm checking the quad tendon. Sometimes I'll have, I'll palpate the tendon in different degrees of flexion to see if that generates pain. Hold the leg there, I'm gonna push down. And I'll also kind of stress the tendon to see if that causes any discomfort. I'm gonna have you bring this down. And then next I move around the knee, I palpate in different areas. Again, I'm checking the VMO to see um, if it's well developed or not. I'm palpating in the medial joint line. This is where the meniscus is. This will be painful with meniscus tears. This will be painful with arthritis of the knee as well. As we move down towards the proximal tibia, there's this area right in the front called the pes tendon. The pes is basically three tendons that come the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus um, attach right here at the front of the tibia. This is where we go when we want to harvest tendons for an ACL reconstruction. And some people get bursitis or tendonitis over there, over that area, and that'll be painful. Um, I will use this knee to show the lateral aspect of the knee. Um, say, as we move down the lateral side, what we're gonna see is, this is where the iliotibial band is. You could feel it. There's a prominence here called the lateral epicondyle, and sometimes people have friction over that area, and that area will be tender. Again, the lateral joint line, lateral arthritis or lateral meniscus tears will also be painful there. And then there's the, the proximal tib fib joint. This is the fibula and the tibia, and that joint sometimes can be a little bit uncomfortable. So this is the palpation of the knee. And then I'm sort of moving on to check um, ligament 
integrity of the knee. I want to see if there's any problems. Now, a lot of times people come in, they were skiing. They have an acute injury. They have an acute injury. I, so I, I, I sort of have a good sense already. But sometimes people have chronic injuries in their knees hurt or, or old injuries or old previous surgeries. And I want to see if those ligaments that may have been reconstructed are intact. So a couple of ligaments we'll talk about. There's a ligament called the medial patella femoral ligament, which helps keep the kneecap in place. And so I'll push on the patella and move it over to see if that causes any apprehension. So if I push it over and it moves further than I would expect compared to the other side, and more importantly, if it makes you uncomfortable, that would be a positive apprehension test. Uh, as we work our way, the ACL, one test is called the anterior drawer, where I'm flexing the knee and pulling forward. Um, and then as How we much movement do you get in a person with a torn ACL? It depends. So a lot depends on what the other, what your normal is. Uh, we, if we base it on millimeters of translation, a torn ACL, it's typically three millimeters or more of translation would indicate a complete ACL rupture. But if it's between zero and three, it often can mean a partial tear. And I have zero, even though it sort of feels like it's moving. So really what I'm saying zero, I'm saying from zero to three, I'm saying zero to three compared to the other side. Yeah. So everybody has their normal, and normal I would say in millimeters, and we know this because we have a device called the KT arthrometer, which measures translation. I'd say a normal is between five and seven mostly, but some people are really loose. Wow, so think about that for a second. Normal is five to seven. A complete tear of the ACL only gives you another three. Right, that's, but that's the lowest, right? So because there are other supporting structures, if you've got a meniscus that can affect the translation, oftentimes a acute rupture, I'll see at 10 millimeters, 12 millimeters, 15 millimeters more than the other side. Wow. But if it's three, it's a sign that it's real. Mm. Less than three, I'm like, this probably isn't fully torn. And how much do you trust that over what the MRI tells you? It's amazingly sensitive. The KT is amazingly sensitive. In fact, it was used before MRI uh, and it's been studied. It said it was, it was I think, 98% sensitive at detecting a ACL tear. And how specific? Very. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the number, but I can yeah, check. Yeah. I, I, we rarely use, I use the KT, not really uh, much anymore for an acute injury, unless I feel the knee. And the, the, most, the most sensitive test, short of the KT, is called the Lachman exam, where I'm stabilizing the femur with one hand, and I'm putting an anterior translation, and I'm feeling for that endpoint. You feel how it stops? Yeah. So that's the endpoint. That's the ACL catching. That's the ACL catching. So it won't go any further. And I know that your ACL is intact. But if it feels a little soft or spongy, then I might get the KT out. Or the other thing is sometimes people have an acute injury, their knee is swollen, and they won't let me do that. So the KT is very tolerable even in the acute situation, more than even my exam. So if I have someone I'm pretty sure, and it, it's one of those things where I also want to let the patient know this is what I think it is and here's some data to tell you why I think it is. Um, but also sometimes I think it's not, but they think it is. And so I use it and I say, look, this is what your left knee is. This is the number we get. This is what your right knee is. This is the number we get. And like, okay, it makes people feel comfortable. Got it. Um, so that, you know, so for ACL, anterior drawer, the Lachman, there's also something called the pivot shift test pivot shift test where I'm putting a little bit of valgus stress on your knee. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to see if there's any clunk. When the iliotibial band moves forward of the axis of rotation, the knee will sort of clunk into place. That's also very difficult to do in the acute setting. Almost no one will let you do that. But in the chronic setting, they will. Um, as, so if we move to um, the posterior cruciate ligament, I do also in 90 degrees, and I'm, what I'm feeling for here is that I can put my finger on your tibia. I feel the tibia plateau immediately. If I can't feel that, if it's flush, the tibia is flush with the medial condyle, it means that your tibia is shifted backwards mm. because the PCL is helping to keep this position. It's called a posterior sag sign. So if I feel that, we're good, but I'll also just push 
to see if I can do that. Sometimes I'll change the rotation of the ankle and push. And sometimes I, if, if it's torn or I think it might be torn, I might sort of interrogate that a little further. So those are the cruciate ligaments in the center of the knee. We also have collateral ligaments, the medial collateral ligament, the lateral collateral ligament. Let me start with the medial collateral ligament. So I do it in extension and basically I'm pushing a force. MCL tears are very common in association with ACL tears, but they also happen in an isolated injury. Most MCL injuries happen proximal. So the MCL, to go over it again, connects the medial epicondyle to the proximal tibia. And when it ruptures, the majority of the times it ruptures from this side. Even if it's a grade three rupture, meaning a complete tear, and it's from the, medi from the proximal attachment, those typically here will heal without surgery. If it's completely torn from the distal aspect, that often needs surgery. That's a more significant and severe. So when people get the triad, so that classic injury where you're hit from the side, you're Correct. skiing and someone comes into you or you're goofing around playing football, you get hit on the outside. It's the ACL, the MCL, and the medial meniscus. Yes. Now, that's the classic triad. To be honest, in acute injuries, we see more lateral meniscus tears than medial meniscus tears. Interesting. Despite sort of that triad that we're all taught. But um, you're generally, if it's a normal, but, but it's the MCL that's torn. Yes. Yeah. And it's typically torn proximally. Correct. Or and mid sub. And you're not repairing it then. You're just going to repair the ACL. So um, what we say is, I'm probably not going to repair it. It's probably going to be stable, but after you reconstruct the ACL, you check the MCL before you leave the operating room. And if it's lax, then you have to fix that too. Uh, and so we check that in about zero degrees and 20 to 30, just to see. People with multiple ligament injuries, it's important to get all of these because you're sort of working through, okay, this is super lax. What is really torn? Because when the knee's flopping around, sometimes it's difficult to do. Um, for the, let's do the lateral, so the lateral structures, there's also a lateral collateral ligament. I'm going to do it on this side, um, which, which originates from the lateral femoral condyle and attaches to the proximal fibula, not the tibia, but the fibula. And there's also other supporting structures. We refer to this as the posterior lateral corner which comprises of, of other, the popliteus tendon and other tendons in the back, that this can be a, an extremely severe injury to rupture all of those structures. And so a similar fashion we do, instead of the valgus stress, where we're stressing the inside, we do what's called a varus stress at zero and a little bit of flexion to see if that's loose. And sometimes you can palpate the ligament and feel that it's taut. So, um, MPFL for patella, ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL, posterior lateral corner, pretty much the ligaments we worry about. Um, meniscus tears, there are some provocative maneuvers we do to see if there's a meniscus tear. The most popular one is McMurray, where I'm just sort of feeling the joint line and seeing if I feel anything, if I feel a click or I feel a pop, or more importantly, does this generate pain? If someone has a significant meniscus tear, they're not going to let me do that. They're going to stop me and I'm, it's going to say, okay, this is probably real. So the, the combination of pain with hyperextension and pain with this sort of maneuver, there are other things that do it. Obviously, if they have an arthritic knee, I'm not going to do that because I already have a sense. So not everybody gets every test because... What is the most um, common misdiagnosis in the knee based on the failure to do a very, very thorough physical exam? It's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think that sometimes we forget about the patella in all of this, and you can have someone come into the office and they say, I was skiing, I twisted, I felt a pop, my knee filled up with fluid right away, and we're all saying to ourselves, oh, you have an ACL tear. And so it's hard to do an exam in that area, so sometimes those two things, if you don't examine both, you may miss one. Now they can happen together, that's very uncommon, but it's important just to check those things. So moving on to the other portions, uh, potential injuries of the lower extremity. Um, 
a lot of people come in complaining of pain in their shin, obviously very common in runners. Uh, and the big important thing to do is to make sure there's not a stress fracture of the tibia. There's a couple of things that we see in athletes in the leg. One of them is stress fracture. The other is shin splints. Uh, it's also called medial tibial stress syndrome. And they sort of have different patterns of presentation. People who have stress fractures typically have very point tenderness. It's not diffuse. People with shin splints tend to have more diffuse tenderness all over a larger area of the bone, whereas stress fractures are pretty tender. And MRIs will miss a lot of stress fractures or they always catch them? They catch them. Okay, it's the x-ray where you miss it typically? Almost, it's really hard. If you find a stress fracture at a first visit of somebody on a tibia, they've had it for a very long time. Um, so we always get x-rays because sometimes there are other things in the bone that we need to make sure, you know, not a tumor or infection or something that we're not expecting. But it's rarely, rarely positive on the x-ray for, for the first presentation. Um, it's also, you have to get, you know, for most insurance companies, you need to get an x-ray in order to order an MRI. Um, so, so those are two things. Shin splints are also called medial tibial stress syndrome and stress fractures. Also, chronic exertional compartment syndrome. There's um, compartment syndrome is where there's increased pressure inside the compartments of the leg. There's an acute situation where we call acute compartment syndrome, which happens if you break the tibia. Um, but there's also some people who run and during the run, they start to get some swelling of, that, of the leg and they even get some tingling and numbness. And, and that's because the muscles are in a very confined space. So as you exercise, the muscle gets fluid in it, hypertrophies, and people will develop those symptoms. So it's important to check all these areas. Um, and also, we also see in the back of the leg, uh, gastroc injuries and Achilles tendon, but we'll be able to evaluate that more in the prone position. So if we start examining the foot, um, I've done a lot of inspection during the standing portion of the exam and have you walk, so I have a good sense of your, your arch. Um, I often will start in the back here um, in, in the posterior aspect of the ankle, the, the tendon that flexes the toe is in that region. Sometimes dancers will have tenderness and uh, tendonitis of that tendon. And so we're palpating back there. As we move medial, you have ligaments that support the ankle. This is the deltoid ligament, and I'm checking the, the integrity of that ligament. Very important tendon called the posterior tibialis tendon, which runs right behind the medial malleolus. This is the medial malleolus, and it inserts down here, and that helps to invert the foot, right? So when you're doing a toe off, when you're walking, that has to engage so you get a rigid foot so you propel. That loosens as you go flat foot when you land, and that needs to soften. People who have injury to that tendon, um, very flat-footed, painful, swelling on the inside of the ankle, and that's the posterior tibialis tendon. And as we palpate along the top of the foot, we have the navicular um, bone and also uh, the, the metatarsal. We check the range of motion of the metatarsal phalangeal joint, interphalangeal joint. Another injury runners get is um, they get arthritis of that first joint. So there's what we often hear about of bunion or hallux valgus where this starts to deviate in. Um, and that can be painful and the second toe can also translate to accommodate that movement. But another thing I see a lot in runners is some arthritis of this joint. And if I hyperextend that hurts as well. At the bottom of the toe, there's also two bones called the sesamoid bones. People get stress fractures and irritation of that. Um, and then we see acute injury in athletics where you actually can injure the ligaments on the bottom, bottom of that toe, it's turf toe. And sometimes that could be serious as well. And they present how? So, severe swell, it's very painful. A lot of swelling on the, on the toe. That's not rarely one of those injuries where you're like, oh, and look what you have. It's really a, a really quite dramatic episode. But for sesamoiditis, or stress fractures of the sesamoid bones, that sort of develops slowly and hurts on there. People with pads, they try to rest a little, they start to land on the outer part of their foot when they run, and that, that uh, needs to be evaluated as well. As we move across sort of the top of the foot, you have the tibialis anterior, which is, this is the tibialis muscle. This is the tendon. And that's probably the most common 
discomfort I will get. And what's very odd is the speed with which it can come on. Mm -hmm. It's like I can be sitting at my desk doing nothing, having no pain, and I get up to go get a drink, and I have, like, there's someone putting a knife into there. Mm -hmm. in it. So in those so in those circumstances, sometimes it's hard to distinguish tibialis anterior tendonitis or inflammation from a process inside the joint because they're so the capsule of the mm. joint is so closely associated. One thing we see a lot with what you talk about is that the tendon will squeak. It actually makes a noise when it gets inflamed. Mm. So people will come in and say, my tendon's squeaking. And that's usually right away we know it's, that's the tibialis anterior. Um, and we palpate the capsule too. Is, and sometimes it's fuller than the other side. Mm. And so then we also range it. We wanna see how far you dorsiflex and plantar flex. For motion purposes, we're checking also the subtalar joint. So just to review, you know, you have the ankle joint and you have the subtalar joint. Subtalar joint yeah. is between the calcaneus and the talus. That, it, that joint is incredibly important for navigating terrain. Yep. If, that has an arth if that's arthritic, some people are even born what's called a, t a coalition where they're fused to each other constant ankle sprains because they can't navigate through terrain and they will easily twist their ankle. Now, I, I sort of seem to have these naturally very high arches. Right. Does that go hand in hand with what seems to be quite a bit of laxity in my ankles and feet? Or is that just from swimming where, you know, you always have to be very, very, very toe pointed? Yeah, there are certain, it could be, there are certain things that are, are developmental as well. Um, there are certain sort of things that you're born with. There's one condition called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease where people have this and, and they will have sometimes get some weakness of the intrinsic muscles in the feet and there'll be some preferential strength in some muscle groups over, over the other. And when we see someone with high arches and it's causing trouble, we, start, we will want to investigate those things. So that's something we would dive into deeper. And I, my arches would be considered high? Yeah, they would. They would. And so also, you know, some people have, you know, we do this called the windlass mechanism where when we, when we put, because when you toe off, right, this is the first mm -hmm. thing that happens, right? You're, you sort of do that motion. Mm -hmm. This will help to tighten. That's the eccentric loading in it yeah. to get ready to spring and, it. And so this will lock the, jo the, lock the subtalar joint. It will make the foot rigid so you can propel. Imagine if you just had pronated feet and you couldn't do this. Yeah, you'd have no spring. That's right. And it would, be, it would become very painful. And then you start to attenuate the tendon on the, on the inside. So that's how we check the arch as well. Um, and then we check these toes. We, we call these, unfortunately, the lesser toes. I don't know if you've heard that term, but this is the big toe and the great, great toe. toe. And these yeah. are the lesser toes. Uh, and we're checking in between the... The, the, the web space to see if there's any tenderness. Sometimes that's a neuroma will, will be painful there. So also have to be mindful of stress fractures in the foot, especially in runners. The navicular, um, the navicular stress fracture is a very serious high risk stress fracture. The metatarsal, second metatarsal, third metatarsal, and we palpate all those. As, let me scoot over a bit. We talk about the lateral. This is where a lot of injuries occur. And so, you know, we check motion, right? And we're just going to see how much motion you have. And sometimes that's because of laxity here. And because you have high arches, you're more likely to have ankle sprains. So this is a circumstance where we would want to uh, palpate the, the ligament. There's the ATFL, anterior talofibular ligament, the calcaneofibular ligament, posterior talofibular ligament. Those three ligaments are the main ligaments that support the ankle. On the lateral side, there's also a ligament that connects the fibula here, the distal tib-fib joint. Um, and sometimes that gets injured, and that's what we would refer to as a high ankle So when ankle a person sprain. sprains their ankle mm -hmm. when they're 15 years old, do those ligaments permanently elongate such that there's lasting instability? Yeah, so there's, oh, there is, for the majority of patients who've had an ankle sprain, the majority go on are fine. They're probably a little lax, but they don't have any clinical repercussions of that. But there's a number of people who have recurrent ankle sprains because when the, you know, an ankle sprain is a tear, it's a tear of a ligament and it has to heal. And sometimes it heals. Sometimes that ligament when it heals can cause pain because it just doesn't heal perfectly. So there's pain related to that healing ligament. Sometimes that ligament is looser. 
and will cause chronic instability where they have recurrent ankle sprains or they just feel very unstable at the ankle. One of the important principles is to make sure that you strengthen the muscles on the outside. These are called the perineal tendons and they go around the back of the lateral malleolus here and they help to stab dynamically stabilize the ankle. So the ligaments are static stabilizers and the tendon is a dynamic stabilizer. So anybody who's sprained the ligament will, um, we, we prescribe physical therapy to make sure those muscles are as strong as possible. And the best physical therapy is sort of like an external rotation? Yes, and balance training, balance training, because people, I often have people, because they don't want to go to therapy and they say, let me do it, let me do it, I could do it on my own, I, I'll just give me some exercises. And I'll show them exercises to do and I have them come back and then I put them through some balance tests and they, they have a horrible time. Uh, you need a balance board. Um, I think you have an interesting device that for balance yeah. purposes. That would be something great for that. Uh, and that's important so that we don't have to have recurring ankle sprains to get those tendons strong. Those tendons also sometimes when they, when you have lateral ankle injuries, you can tear the connective tissue that keeps the tendon in the groove. And the tendon in certain motions will subluxate out of the groove and snap. Mm. So, you know, just like the test with the hip where we do the circumduction, patients will come in and they'll show you. They'll do this, they'll circumduct the ankle, and the, it will flip in and out. That's also missed often, too. People have ankle sprains, it's swollen, it hurts, and they're not necessarily checking for that problem, and you have to be diligent about making sure you evaluate that as well. This is another um, sort of functional test uh, to see the tightness of the calf. So the calf is basically your gastroc and your soleus. When your knee is in this 90 degree position, the gastroc is relaxed. And so uh, when you do an ankle dorsiflexion, you may get excellent motion and you wanna make sure that you're bringing it straight up and you're checking the tightness of your soleus. But then we extend your knee fully and we do it again to see if we get the same amount of excursion. And if not, you know it's the gastroc that's It's the that's gastroc tight. that's tight, correct. Correct. Okay. So Achilles. Achilles, prone position. Uh, so uh, very common to someone to come in and they have a, a, a rupture or they feel something sharp in the back of their calf. Uh, they felt a pop. It's almost as if someone kicked them in the back of the leg. And what I'm looking for is, an, is whether or not the Achilles tendon is intact. And when Achilles tendon is intact, you see this nice contour of the tendon, it's not swollen. Oftentimes, or most times, if it's rupture, you will feel a defect if it's an acute situation. Um, there's something called the Thompson squeeze test, and I, if I squeeze the calf, the foot should go forward. It's also important to check the other side to see that the attitude of the foot is equal. Someone who has a complete rupture, their foot will be like this, and you, you know right away. It's not a very hard diagnosis to make in an acute Achilles tendon rupture unless you don't look. Um, most actually injuries in the calf or the back of the of leg is, uh, is an injury right where the gastroc, medial gastroc muscle becomes the tendon. So muscle tendon unit attaches here. This is a weak spot where the muscle become, attaches to the tendon. And this we call this tennis leg, and it's fairly common. And also people will feel that pop in that area. And that's it.